Welcome, welcome, beautiful people. And it's your girl, Tammy. Let's just get into it, y'all. We are on episode seven of season six of The Shy. And this was just really one of the sadder, somber episodes. As we know, in season in episode six, Papa's father is murdered at the end of the episode. He's strangled to death while he's praying in the kitchen in the house, alone downstairs while he's reading the Bible. So this whole episode was obviously following that tragic incident, and we are following the funeral and really the arrangements in the funeral for P- Popper's or Pastor Jackson's home going. Um, and, you know, they try to start it off a little cinematic. They got Papa strolling a la Spike Lee style. You know how, like, Spike Lee's characters sometimes in his films will have him, like, um, it's almost like they're roller skating down the block. Uh, especially when they're alone, Spike does that like camera pull. And so they kind of have Papa doing that as he's sort of like heading to uh, the funeral home or heading to dad's church, actually, uh, just to go in and to like pray by himself. He's obviously angry because, you know, he had a really bad moment with his father the last time they saw each other. He stormed out. His dad said, don't return home if you're going to be disrespectful. And they had a really negative exchange. And the next thing you know, in the flash of an instant, his father is gone. So we see Papa praying in the church. Um, and then on the other side of town, we see another scene where Bakari is rolling up to the chop shop where Nuck is. And he's looking for Duda. He walks in, he's screaming. He's like, where's Duda? Where's Duda? He rolls up on Nuck and the other young man is like now part of the crew. And he has a gun on him and he is dead serious. He rolls up with the gun. He points it directly at Nuck and he's about to go off. He's saying like, y'all didn't have to kill him. And he's talking about Pastor Jackson. And we obviously know that Pastor Jackson, along with his wife and Papa have really embraced Bakari like a son and like a brother. He lives with them and they took him in where he didn't have anybody. And we kind of learned in the last episode when we met Bakari's sister that, you know, he's been on his own for a minute. Like their parents, you know, weren't really great. I believe they were like on drugs or got killed or something. And it's just been him and his sister when they were very, very young. But then they got separated and went to different group homes and then kind of just, you know, had the the darker group home life of, you know, a kid that just didn't have family off and on running away from places, staying places. So this is this first stable situation he's ever been in. And now that situation is gone. He rolls up on Nuck and Nuck is like, dude, that's not even here. You know, don't use that. You know, don't point that gun unless you're ready to use it. And Bakari is pissed. He even reminds them that, hey, I've killed before. And it reminds us in that moment that Bakari was the one that killed Ronnie, um, you know, a few seasons back. He murdered Ronnie and Nuck reminds him like, yeah, you killed Ronnie, but you shot Ronnie in the back of the head, you know, un- unbeknownst to him. Like he was, ro- you know, he was walking past with Tasha and he shot him from behind. So you're not bold enough to shoot somebody in the face. Bakari backs down. Nuck says, um that they are his family and that Pastor Jackson and Papa weren't really his family and you have to protect family and he was a liability. We go back to the church and we see that Papa is praying. Obviously he's angry, he's upset, he's talking to God as to why his father. Jake and Kevin come walking in and they sit in a pew behind him. They uh, ask Papa if he needs anything and they just sort of offer a level of comfort to him you know, they ask Papa, does he want to be alone? Does he want to have them just sit there and be quiet? What does he want them to do? And he asks to be alone. Kevin and Jake get up and sort of put their hands on his shoulder. And then they proceed to let him, you know, be by himself. They sort of are walking out the church. And as they're walking out the church, in walks Bakari on the other end. He sees them walking down one way and he goes around. I don't know if he was switching because he felt maybe... You know, it wouldn't be cool with them to bump into them at the same time that they would not feel that way. Because a lot of this episode, I was really shocked as to how calm and like good Papa was. Because I know I'd be ready to be somebody else. <laughs> but for whatever reason, he is really rocking out with the positivity as much as he can past just his natural anger. Um, Bakari walks up, him and Papa start to argue. And essentially, Papa is blaming Bakari for his father's death. He knows that Duda's people had something to do with it. And he feels like a lot of it had to do, you know, why is Bakari, Bakari's mixed up with Duda because he works for him. And Bakari's saying like, you know, it's not my fault. I never intended for this to happen, but it really doesn't matter because it occurred anyway. 
Meanwhile, we head over to where Keisha and Emmett are fighting. And we already know Keisha is pissed off with Emmett for multiple reasons. You know, she just lost a job. She feels like part of her losing her job, even though they told her it was budget cuts, is because she's having to take up so much slack at the house because Emmett is always out and about. You know, partially for Smokies, which wasn't an issue for her, but it's also, you know, constantly running around town with Duda, who's trying to do, you know, this whole big ball of energy thing and get Emmett stuck in that. And it's been something that's been a problem for them. But we know that last episode, Keisha found a bunch of money that Nuck handed to Emmett to hide in the house. Emmett kind of threw it down in, in the bag down in the living room. He thought he was hiding it. Keisha ended up finding it, and it was a big source of problems for them. You know, this is just making her feel like she can't trust him. And the big thing for Keisha when they first got together was that Emmett be honest with her and, you know, be truthful with her. And she really wants to get from under Duda. I mean, to me, I understand where she's coming from, but also if you wanted to get from under Duda, why did y'all take a loan from this man to buy this house? I feel like he was already tied in so much with Duda early on with certain things. Buying that home, although it's not like a good idea, Duda was the one that gave them the loan and she knows that. So to me, if you wanted to get from underneath this man, you should have never even took a loan out for a house. They should have still been living in that apartment until they had figured it out because now they're even more intertwined to him. Uh, Keisha's leaving. She's packing her stuff up. She's like, I'm going. Emin is like, what are you doing? She's like, I'm leaving. Like, I can't. This, you know, Pastor Jackson was essentially killed. This is our pastor. And we know Duda has something to do with it. You're tied up with this man. We could be next. You know, they have kids. You know, she has a kid specifically. And then he has three kids and they all stay in their house. And it's like, I'm not trying to be the next one. Emmett is saying he could never let that happen. And she's like, you can't promise that. You're not, you know, going to be the guy that's going to be the protector in that way. Not saying that she's not saying he's a protector, but just that. Emmett's not the street dude, you know what I'm saying? And you don't know what these guys are capable of. Nobody thought that Pastor Jackson would be killed and murdered the way he was, and now he's gone. You can't protect us, and I can't be at risk sitting in this house. Emmett's son comes down, sees, sees that they're arguing, and he says, don't argue. Um, you know, Emmett begs Keisha to stay, and he says he will figure something out. He will figure out the situation for them. And, you know, he said that they promised each other that they wouldn't leave because it was an argument that they would stay and stick it out and work through things. And Keisha's just like, you know, it's a matter of life and death. And he's like, I will figure it out. So he said, in the meantime, you know, he said, you know, she said she's going to stay. Uh, she agrees to stay, but she'll stay in a separate bedroom. He says, cool. He says he's going to go get the other bedroom ready. And it is what it is as long as she's staying in the house. Emmett says, you know, he's going to fix it. We then head over to Victor and Jake and they're having breakfast. And Jake is asking Victor, you know, about how he's feeling about everything. And specifically, obviously, we all know at this point, everybody knows that Pastor Jackson was murdered. And Victor wants to know how Jake is feeling. And Jake says that, you know, he's unfortunately sad for his friend and obviously sad about the situation, but he's also shocked that Victor is asking him how he's feeling because he feels like Victor doesn't tell him enough stuff. He tries to like keep him in a kid's place and not be honest and fully um, transparent with him. And Jake has actually been very shocking this season where he's been very open and very um, insightful about a bunch of different things that have been going on. He's, his maturity is really, really shocking me. And I'm really, really proud of the person Jake is becoming. Jake feels like Victor doesn't tell anything to him and always keeps him in the dark. So Victor tells the 80th person, and I mean, Jake makes sense, but too many people know about his situation with Duda and hiding Q's body. But he essentially tells him that he helped Duda hide Q's body and, you know, the FBI is now looking into him. Victor tells Jake that, you know, Duda is a bad guy and Jake already knows that. He kind of already figured out even before Victor said it that he helped him do that. Um, Jake tells, you know, Victor that, you know, does he want his advice in terms of how to deal with the FBI? Because obviously Jake knows that if he was to, that if Victor was to tell the FBI what was going on, he would possibly go to jail. Jake says that if it was him, he wouldn't snitch um, and that the community needs him. He's really proud of his brother and who he's becoming. And he really doesn't think it's beneficial for him to tell the truth about it because then that means he gets taken away from the community and is then he can't have any effectual change. Victor definitely still doesn't know what he's going to do. And I think a large part of his story this season has been about that looming over his head. He struggled a lot since he's been elected with trying to figure out where he stands, but also trying to figure out what he's going to do in regards to 
you know, the FBI um, finding out that he could be possibly involved with Duda and the murder of their informant. Now, in a shocking turn of event, we then see Keisha at Bianca's lounge talking to Nuck. Now, you know, y'all, I forgot, and I guess I didn't forget, but I know we're reminded at Keisha and Emmett's homecoming that Keisha used to date Nuck. They were a couple before she was, um, you know, back with Emmett. I don't remember this. I think it was in high school or something, but he obviously cares for her. And he also identifies at the home, at the, um, at the housewarming that he saw Keisha the night that she was kidnapped by her track coach, you know, when she went through that whole dramatic situation that obviously resulted in her child because she was essayed by him and kidnapped by him and held captive. And Nuck felt like he could have saved her. So he feels like he owes her. And, you know, they had this emotional moment and were reminded that they had a connection and Nuck, you know, feels like he owes her. So Keisha basically looked like she calling in her favor for him to say she needs him to help keep her family safe. She says that... um she feels like she wants him to do whatever he can do to keep Duda off of them and to keep Emmett safe because Emmett's also her family. And Nuck says he can't tell Duda what to do. She says, I know you have his ear. He's like, look, that don't listen. he don't listen to me. So, you know, whatever you think I can do, I really can't do the way you think. And she says, you owe this to me. Like, you really need to protect my family. She leans in on her softer side. You could tell Keisha's leaning on their history together and how Nuck feels about her because he does, I think, still love her in a way. And you can tell she's leaning in on all of that when she's putting the pressure on him to keep her safe and keep her kids safe. And I think Nuck's feeling about his obligation to her is what's going to allow him to, you know, maybe have a protective feeling towards her when it comes to Duda. And it also identifies for us that as we're pulling through this story and have we pulled through the entire season, each character or multiple characters rather have been set up for the idea that something's going to happen to Duda at the end. I feel like that's going to happen. Hey, I predicted that Pastor Jackson was going to get killed and he did. I feel like a lot of the storylines this season have set us up so that there are enemies to Duda that are plenty, right? At this point, we got Rob because Q was his uncle when he was killed. Rob's mother wants Duda taken care of because of that situation. We got um, Emmett now with his family being threatened. We got Darnell who doesn't like that Duda's in Emmett's life and is a guy that he does not like and trust. You know, we got Bakari, who now, although he works for Duda, has this grudge to keep against him. So we've got different people in the mix that, um, you know, would rather see Duda gone. We then see Victor talking to his chief of staff, and they're asking what they can do because the community is really afraid. Because if a pastor can be killed in the community, what could happen to the rest of us? So they're trying to figure out what they need to do to ease the community's stress and worry about their own safety. And they propose to have a community vigil um, where everybody will dress in all white. There's, they can grieve and there's no cameras allowed, no media allowed as much as possible. They don't want to announce it everywhere. They just want the community to come and to grieve the loss of their local pastor and also to make sure that they can reassure them that they're trying to keep them safe. And part of what is considered a stage of grief, we see Papa revisited, I guess, around the anger stage. You know, we have those... Uh, stages of grief that you go through when loss happens. And Papa's definitely in his angry stage at the beginning part of this episode. And Papa is upset with a bunch of different things. You know, he's upset with Bakari at the beginning because he feels like Bakari's association to Duda um, could have precipitated, you know, his father's death. He's upset about the way things ended with him and his dad because they they normally didn't fight and he loves his father dearly. And the fact that they were in a mad place, but that was the last thing that happened with them. But he also is pissed because he's just angry in general, but he is getting love and support from his family, including the new young lady, Keisha, that he met at Smokey's, his coworker he's now talking to. One of the things that Papa argued with his dad about was Keisha before he, um, his father was killed. So that is a, like a sore spot for him because his father told him that, you know, he wasn't feeling that he was dating Keisha or talking to her. He didn't like the fact that Keisha was, I guess, a single mom and she's very young. He felt like that was a lot for his son to be doing. Um, and he also said that her parents, who are also pastors, I guess, or in the church, that her father's a um, kind of a 
corrupt, I guess, as a pastor. He's one of those like prosperity preachers that does only things about the collection plate. And he wasn't feeling that for his son. And so that's a large part of what him and Papa fought about before Papa walked out and he told Papa don't come back. So it sits sore with him. Kenya is in the house with Papa trying to console him. She's talking with him and talking through things with him and things that, you know, he's going to try to do for his father for the funeral. But Papa is still reeling in his anger and he just gets really disrespectful um, with her. He really is shutting her out and she sort of gets up and is like, you know, getting ready to leave and just, she's not feeling the situation, but she is trying to understand his anger and being there for him. He shuts her out. He lets her know the last fight he had with his father was about her and his father didn't think it was a good idea for them to see each other. And he tells her that he agrees and dismisses her. She walks out the door. Meanwhile, Keisha is actually talking with her therapist. We know like in the last episode or so, an episode before this, Keisha had expressed to Emmett that she wanted to go to see a therapist. All the stuff that she's been through from her kidnapping to the school and dealing with Emmett and all the drama and trauma that she's been through, Keisha hasn't really ever sat down with a licensed professional to talk these things out. And she tells Emmett she needs to sit down with someone. After this firing from her job, she just, she needs to work out a lot of things. So she's sitting with the therapist. They're having multiple conversations. She talks to a therapist about Emmett. She talks to a therapist about her own parents. And she says that, you know, when she thinks about how her relationship with Emmett goes, she thinks about her parents' relationship and her therapist does identify that Keisha's relation, parents' relationship could be something that she draws upon when how she deals with Emmett and specifically about him keeping her safe, about her constantly making sure that, you know, she's good. And Keisha expresses that, you know, one of the reasons she's so staunch on being very independent and having her own thing going is because her mother and her father when they were married, you know, it was brief that she remembers them being married. But what she does remember about their relationship is that her father was very controlling. He, you know, made the money. He paid for everything. Her mother did not work. And at that time, and she just felt like her mother was trapped in that. And as a result, she let him have so much control. And she just didn't stand up for herself enough in that relationship. And the therapist points out the, the correlation that Keisha worries about control because her mother never had it. And as a result... She thinks that, um, you know, that's why she deals with being an equal partner with Emmett because she didn't feel like her mother had equality in her relationship. That really hit deep because I think that that's a lot of relationships that women have with their moms and, you know, um, and women have in general society wise is making sure that you have that equity in your voice because you can see what can happen when one person has the ultimate control of anything. She thinks that it would be a good idea if Keisha's mom came to therapy. Keisha is hesitant about that. She wants her therapy sessions to be about her. But her therapist feels like a lot of Keisha's um, dealings in her life with relationships with men and with friendships and even just personal life choices are directly related to her relationship with her mother. And she says to Keisha that we've got to work through that stuff because honestly, in order for you not to be heartbroken in this scenario or any relationship going forward, you need to maybe talk to the first person that broke your heart. And she thinks that that's Keisha's mom. Okay, so Darnell is talking with Emmett about Duda and the whole situation about Keisha possibly leaving him. And Darnell is sort of, you know, working through what is Emmett going to do if this situation happens? You know, he says that people can leave and Emmett's like, yeah, but we got to work this situation out. And, you know, Darnell's like, you know, she doesn't feel safe. You have to understand where her anger comes in. She's got a kid to worry about. She's concerned about her safety. Um, Emmett says he understands that he's done with Duda, but it's a struggle because he doesn't completely know how to leave that situation. When he talked to Duda last episode, Duda gave him some implication that he could buy himself out from the situation and then they could talk about, you know, uh, separating from everything. I don't believe that to be true. I think that Duda's just setting him up. I think Emmett really believes he could just cut a check to Duda and it would be okay. And that's usually not the case with, you know, drug dudes and guys who are street gangsters and stuff like that. That's not how that works. You almost could never leave that fold. And if you do, you have to do something really bold. But he didn't talk Emmett into thinking he could buy him out. Emmett said that he needs to buy Duda out and then they, you know, he can be separate from him. And he doesn't really know how he's going to do that because the thing about the money that Emmett has coming in is questionable. You know, when we started this season, it was supposed to be that Duda and Emmett were going into the business together with Smokies. 
there was some vast idea about the fact that Smokies would eventually expand into other places, but that wasn't even a, a, like a, a forethought that was sitting with Emmett at the time. All of a sudden, we get to the first episode and Duda is saying that they already got a restaurant in New York that actually Emmett has never seen. You know, that they're expanding, they're doing other things. Like, how are we doing all these business ventures when I only went into you with this one restaurant? I haven't even seen the other thing. And all we know is Emmett's got tons of money in his account and doesn't know, like, you know, what to do with it. So this is like a lot of drama going on there. But Darnell says, we're going to figure this out together, son. And even if that means that, you know, I guess he was implying that he would maybe be able to loan Emmett some money too, that they'll figure it out together when the time comes so he can give him a new Duda's wing. Now, across town, Maisha is waiting for Gemma to arrive to the studio. You know, it's really costly for them to get into the studio. It costs a lot of money. And, you know, Maisha's big thing is that since she met that other rapper in the store, she realizes that she needs to start making more music. And Gemma has said, like, you need to start making more tracks. Like, you're not, your own. this one song that you had was good, but we got to keep giving the people stuff and feeding them stuff if your career is going to grow. So they're back in the studio. Maisha is waiting for Gemma to show up and Gemma's late. So she's already pissed. When they get there, Gemma's saying, sorry, she had another meeting to go to, and that's why they met. Now, Maisha's her only client. Mind you, they're fresh out of high school, but let them tell it they've been in the music industry forever. And Maisha's kind of twirling through her head like, wait a minute, why are you late? What other meeting could you possibly have? Was it a meeting for me? But Maisha kind of realizes that Gemma probably has met with Bakari's sister. Now, as we know, Bakari had a sister that strolled into town last week popped up out of nowhere and supposedly came into some money. I got my theories on that because I low-key feel like she might have been the one to kill Pastor Jackson. I think his sister does like some horrible stuff on the side to like come into that, she, to come into that money that she said she came into because she led a similar life to Bakari in terms of like them living on the street, home to home, pillar to post, not really having a place to stay. And then she shows up fresh, completely clean and randomly in Chicago after not having been there for years and years. Anyway, what we find out at a party, um, you know, last week at Kevin's house is that she also raps and she's pretty good. And Gemma is, was attracted to that completely because of the fact that, you know, she wants to be a manager. She wants to be working in entertainment and she loved the flow, how the crowd was feeling her. And Maisha got a little jealous because she was sitting there like, well, dang, you know what I'm saying? Like you looking at her. I mean, everybody was into her. Even Kevin looked like, you know, okay. He made a comment like, oh, she was dope. And Maisha was not feeling that. So she's fueled by that anger about that situation. And then now she's questioning Gemma as to whether or not she met with Bakari's sister. Gemma actually confirms that she did meet with Bakari's sister. And she is pissing. Maisha's like, I'm your artist. She's like, well, I can have more than one person. And she's like, well, she's not even that good. She's like, actually, she's great. And she's polished and ready to go. She already has an album done. You don't even have like a second or third single yet. So, you know, I'm going to be possibly managing both of you. So they kind of get into a back and forth argument that was completely hilarious because obviously Maisha's in the booth, so she can't actually hear Gemma when Gemma's talking back. And so the sound engineer has to keep hitting the button whenever Gemma wants to argue back and forth with her. And it was utterly hilarious. Um, But Gemma says, look, we need to be focused on the studio time. You need to go ahead and make this song. Maisha is pissed. And that fuels her to make a very, very, very dope song in the studio and they actually create like a mini video for it while we're watching it um and she's rapping some of the best that she has ever done meanwhile later that evening shad is at home with his girlfriend they're on the couch or they're in the bedroom kind of sleep and he hears some rustling and he realizes that someone is trying to break into their house and so he like he hears it again and he gets up and he runs to the vent because that's where he put the bag of guns now mind you his girlfriend does not know those guns are there she does not know what's going on i think they were on the couch sleep knocked out probably from watching tv or something like that and so he runs to the bag of guns and he gets out a shotgun he runs to the kitchen because that's where he hears the sound and he pulls the shotgun and he yells to the person and they like you know he hears like scattered it sounds like it could have been a dog but then it sounds like it could have been a person but either way when he walks back out the kitchen the girlfriend is up and she sees the bag. She sees the gun and then she sees the bag of guns and she is pissed. She asks him where those bag of guns are coming from, that they cannot stay in this house. What are you doing with them? Like everything is swirling through her mind. And she's like, you know, this, you need to get those out of here. Like now, like I'm already uncomfortable with this. Why would you have that in the home with us? Anything could happen to us. And he's like, if it hadn't been for these guns, we wouldn't be, if somebody was trying to break into the house, we wouldn't have anything. And she's like, I don't want those here. 
Like, what's going on? Why are you even associated with this? She basically so tells him, like, you need to get those out of here right now, like, tonight. So I don't even want to hear anything about your explanations. We'll talk about that part later. And, you know, this means that he could possibly be on thin ice with her. You know, he is living with her, not paying any bills. He's not really getting money like that. So he does what he has to do, and he proceeds to take the guns out of the house. Now, per Keisha's instructions about Emmett handling things with Duda, he heads over to Bianca's lounge to talk with uh, Duda. Duda is not there. You know, Emmett's still in his big and bold energy. And he says, where's Duda? And Nuck says, Duda keeps office hours. He's not here. So he's like, look, he gets Nuck instead. He starts talking with him about, you know, why he needs to talk to Duda and that Keisha really is afraid because of what happened to Pastor Jackson. Nuck tells um, Emmett that he knows Keisha's afraid because Keisha came and talked to him. Emmett was not feeling that. He was not feeling that at all. So Emmett is pissed. He doesn't really let Nuck know that Keisha, he's pissed that Keisha came and talked to him. And Nuck kind of is sliding that underneath there because he wants to like ruffle Emmett's feathers a little bit of the fact that Keisha came to him about something that, you know, Emmett was supposed to handle. Nuck tells him Keisha already handled it because she talked to him. He's going to see what he can do. And then we move forward, but Emmett is not over with that situation. And meanwhile, back at Victor's house, he's talking to Fatima's family. And as we know, you know, Fatima is trans and she, you know, grew up, you know, you know, having to figure out and navigate her way in the world. And, you know, part of her adulthood, she ended up staying at a home with a whole bunch of other like trans women. And there's women there that, you know, she considers to be like her family who, who helped her navigate life and who like raised her. And so Victor met those women, I want to say about two episodes ago or so. And now he's asking them um, basically if he thinks Fatima would be willing to start a family with him. He wants to get their opinion because they know her better than anybody. And he doesn't know if she would want him in her future. They say, of course she wants to, but they understand his apprehension. You know, they don't want him to, promise things to Fatima and then, you know, things get pulled from underneath her because the disappointment would be heartbreaking for her. He says he's not trying to do that. He just wants to make sure that she even wants to do something like that. Like he feels like he talks to her and they communicate, but he's not completely sure. And before he presses forward, he just wants to get their opinion. They say that they appreciate that he's noble in that capacity and that, um, you know, he really does want to do right by her. And they appreciate that he's coming to them to ask those questions. They do think that she's ready, but they think that he needs to really just talk with her about the situation. As we said before, the therapist encouraged Keisha to bring her mother, Nina, to the therapy sessions. And Keisha was reluctant, but she still um, decides to bring her. And I think this was one of my favorite parts of the entire episode. I love that um, we got a chance to see this. I know that there are a lot of therapists who encourage people over time, you know, after multiple sessions to possibly include a partner or to include a family member in there to have a deeper discussion. And this was a much needed one. I honestly was a little bit disappointed in Keisha towards the end of this because I feel like her maturity level wasn't there and really listening to her mother. And I actually feel like Nina took in what the therapist said. But essentially the therapist starts talking to Keisha and her mom in the session. And Keisha's mother does, you know, feels like she doesn't like the fact that she sometimes feels like she gets blamed for the situations dealing with her children because she feels like she's tried her hardest to be a very good parent. And Keisha indicates that, yes, Nina was a great provider and she is a good parent, but sometimes in her being, making sure that they had everything that they needed because, you know, she was by herself at that point providing for them. Keisha feels like the emotional or nurturing part wasn't always there and they had to sort of raise themselves. And essentially Keisha had to then raise and give some of those parts to Emmett and how much was really left for her. And Nina apologizes. She was, uh, you know, trying to be the best parent possible, especially when she had to do it on her own before Dre. And she also brings up the fact that, you know, a lot of times the nurturing side wasn't there as much once she left work because she had to give everything to her kids. And then also them, it was not a lot left for her to come home and bring to them. Um, so, you know, they, she sort of says that she wishes that they could tap in more to other things because Nina also feels like now that the kids are getting older, they're sort of like spreading their wings and going in different places and she doesn't feel as needed as much. And, you know, they start to explore her own views about parents, parenting and motherhood and how she felt about her own life growing up. And Keisha says she wished she could tap more into those stories 
it's interesting because I feel like I understand some of what she's going through. Not so much about that. Cause I think my mom and our relationship and my sisters, I feel like we have different relationships in that way. But like, I know my mom focuses, focuses on that a lot with my family. Like she wants us to have, you know, a relationship with her that she had with my grandmother, which was very much like talking about real life as you get older, being very close and connected and, you know, being able to reach back to your parents for advice about life and things like that and being able to tap into them and have that connection. So it's beautiful that we're seeing this explored on television. Um, but Nina basically says that she doesn't, she was told what to do back then, especially in, in her era, but also from her parents. They expected her to just, you know, get married, meet a nice young man, you know, start a family, and that was it. And she always had other dreams. She said that she, if she could do it all over again, you know, Keisha said, would, would she have kids? And she said she doesn't know. She said she absolutely loves her children, and she lets them know, like, she loves her kids. Like, she does not regret her children anything. But she said that she didn't, that wasn't the dream for herself, that initially what she wanted to do was explore the world and even explore her sexuality. And she didn't get to do that. She was kind of told like, hey, you marry a guy, you're going to be with this man, you're going to marry him and love him, you're going to give him children, you're going to be a mother, you're going to just like walk through the world. And she feels like she didn't get a chance to explore that. She says she didn't even know if she wanted children. And that really hits Keisha hard. She says that she doesn't regret her kids and she loves her children, but it wasn't her dream initially to do that. And Keisha says, like, you know, well, why would you say that now we have to, you know, why would you, is that saying that you didn't want me, you didn't want Kevin, I, I'm not somebody that you wanted. And she's like, no, that's not how I feel. The therapist says that they need to sit with this situation because they want her to kind of resolve it right away. And she says, no, you need to take that fully in. And Keisha kind of still leaves a bit angry about Nina saying that she doesn't know if she wanted kids. And I was a little bit upset with Keisha's immaturity at this moment because I felt like it wasn't a personal hit. She was just bringing up who she was then and how she felt and, you know, what her life might have been. And it really gives you a chance to explore that your parents are more than just your parents. And that was Nina's big issue is that she wants her kids to see her, especially in adulthood, as a full human and not just as their mom. And for so many young people, you know, seeing your, your mother as more than just your mom is like crazy to them because that's all they've ever known in that role of capacity, seeing that she could be a lover and, you know, uh, a wife or a girlfriend or, you know, have her own dreams that she never got to fulfill because she had kids or, the, you know, all these different things. We don't like to explore the full humanity of people. And I love that this therapy session opened that up. I want Keisha to not take it so personal in this next episode so we don't, you know, have to see all of this drama. Meanwhile, Kevin is packing for L.A. and him and Emmett just have this really warm moment where, um, you know, he's packing up his stuff and Emmett can't believe he's leaving. And Kevin also just wants to thank Emmett because if we remember when we first saw and started this um, series, you know, Kevin had a really close relationship with Brandon who was killed. And, you know, he was always knew who Emmett was because Emmett and Keisha were friends and then they had dated at some point. But Emmett really stepped up as a young man when Brandon was killed to really be there for Kevin and to be a brother, a big brother figure. And essentially that's what he's been, even if Keisha and Emmett were together or not for Kevin. And it's been really beautiful to see because Kevin doesn't have any other siblings but Keisha. So they have a really cute emotional moment and Kevin continues packing. Now y'all know I love the shy, but the acting in this part was just, it reminds you that they're still like very young actors in this and that they're still like maturing in their ability. It was a serious moment, but it also was like, dang, it it didn't hit me as emotionally deep. Like I understood the the scene and the necessity of this conversation and the beauty in it. And but I also felt like, dang, they just kind of young. So that emotional, um, excuse me, ooh, I'm losing my voice, y'all. That emotional depth as young people is still maturing as actors. Cause I didn't completely get into the emotion. Sometimes it was a little bit like this could have been better acted but i also understand that they're young characters so you know they'll make do anyway the scene that i'm referring to is the fact that bakari shows up to papa or pastor jackson's wake and all that's there is papa and some other people like that are at the actual wake and um bakari walks in he's incredibly sad and he goes up to the casket he's just crying and papa kind of walks up and they have this conversation and Papa explains that, um, you know, Bakari 
is, you know, Bakari explains that, you know, he never expected any of this to happen, that, you know, Pastor Jackson is was like a father to him and he treated him like a son and he's never had that. And he would have never wanted this for him. He would have never foreseen this. And it, he's also losing as well because of this. I love the maturity in this moment because Papa really could have strangled this kid. Like, I don't even know how I would feel about the fact that the guy who could be somewhat associated with the person that could have killed my father or did kill my father or had one of his, you know, henchmen kill my father really is here. Look at that henchman <laughs> kill my father that he really is showing up here. And I know that it's not completely Bakari's fault, but just him being associated with this person still. Papa's maturity level was A1 here. Um, Papa basically says that, you know, he did love Bakari like a son. And we know that because we saw them building up that narrative, you know, before this episode where, you know, they were going to have an argument about, I think, two episodes back and Bakari was going to leave. And Papa's father was like, no, son, you need to stay here. This is a family conversation in your family. The way that his family embraced Bakari was just so beautiful in these moments and even allowing him to obviously be at the funeral. There were just so many moments where you realize that it was a beautiful thing that Bakari got to experience this family, uh, even if it's very late stages in his life. Uh, Papa explains that the dad loved Bakari like a son and he wanted the best for him. He wanted them to be brothers. He wanted peace and he, he would want them to be peaceful in this situation. They, tr they hug it out and try to keep themselves at peace. And, you know, we head on to Bakari sitting outside the funeral home uh, later on. So Bakari sitting outside the funeral home and up to him walks Shad pissed off with the bag of guns. And Shad says, you got to take this bag of guns out this house. Like my girl found out about these. We had somebody try to break in the home and she found out and it's a no go for me. I can't lose that woman and I can't be out on the street with Joe behind trying to figure it out because, you know, I got these guns in my house that are illegal. You got to get this away from me. Bakari actually is okay with it. He just says, look, I understand. Like, I don't want to mess up nobody else's life. Like, I feel like this guy's already deceased because of me. I don't want to mess up your situation. And he tells him, like, you know, just give me it and I'll figure it out. Shaz says, look, whatever you do, do not take these guns to that pastor's house. Like, you staying there right now. Like, this family is allowing you to stay here despite everything that's went down. Do not put them in danger. Do not put their situation more in danger than you already have in addition to that. Then we got to see the lounge where Duda is sitting with Nuck and that other young man that just joined his little crew. And they're playing chess and they're having this conversation. And Duda's trying to explain something around the idea that, you know, you have to, you know, play strategically in life and what you're doing, all of those different things. And Nuck is kind of bringing up the fact that the whole Pastor Jackson thing was weird. Duda tries to say, you know, when you're playing chess, you have to, you know, think strategically and, Nuck is trying to infer the fact that like with the Emmett situation and Keisha, they need to like lean off of doing too much in the community and causing too much stir because it will come back on them. And Duda tries to say something like when in chess, you know, you're, you're supposed to protect your queen. Well, Nuck says you're supposed to protect your queen and Duda says you're not supposed to protect your queen. You're supposed to use your queen strategically. Trying to imply like Nuck should try to manipulate the situation with Keisha and not try to protect Keisha which I feel like was his first thought process in terms of what he needs to do to approach Keisha requesting that he do something about the Duda situation and protecting her family. And that includes Emmett. So back with Victor and Fatima, Victor finally sits down with Fatima as he talked to her family previously. And they have this discussion about that. He says that he loves her. She's made their house a home. She really did an amazing job redecorating that house. Cause y'all know it used to be like almost like a drug den. And then it was like a weird space before that. They never really cleaned it up. They kind of painted the walls. But it still was just like a really crappy home. Because remember, it used to be like a hangout for Reggie and his drug dealing friends. And Jake was living under that. So Fatima really transformed that home. It looks very beautiful now. And he basically says that he wants to start a family with her. But he's nervous because of all the stuff that he's going through. And Fatima can't believe it. She's excited and she says that like, she's interested, but she's a little nervous because she doesn't want, like her family said, for this to get pulled from underneath her. Is he sure about her? Is he sure about the situation? Because what he is promising, she's buying into and she doesn't want to get hurt. He says, yes, he wants to give her everything that, you know, she wants and that he wants for them. And she says, we can start to talk about starting a family because obviously they can't start a family in the traditional way. And she's wanting to pace herself. Cause she doesn't want to get caught up too soon and everything be going right from underneath her. Bakari 
on the other side of town breaks into Lene's house. Y'all, I was so hot in this moment because Bakari comes into Lene's room. You know, he often climbs into her bedroom window um, in the middle of the night and I'll hang out and he'll sleep. He slept at the house before in her room and then snuck out the next morning because he hasn't had a place to stay. That's happened before. But he sneaks into the house with the bag of guns. Now, mind you, there's not a lot of places that Bakari could take these guns to. You know, he's, he can't take them to a bunch of different people. He doesn't have his own place. You know, Shag gave them back to him. He can't take them to Papa's house. So I just knew when he crawled through this window that he was going to ask this girl to do that. Now, mind you, you this girl was on punishment in that room because on prom night, she got caught in the car with you, driving, you speeding in a stolen car that was not yours. And y'all was speeding and this girl has no criminal record. And she has a brother who just got out of jail who said, do not get my sister in trouble. He had to come bail her out along with her parents because you did not heed what he said and were not responsible. And you know, Jamal got out of jail after murdering somebody. So he was not playing with Bakari in that moment. And he really don't want nothing to do with him. Jamal still came to Bakari after that. And instead of like beating his behind down, was like, look, you need to just leave my sister alone. Y'all need to be separate for a while. But he understands Bakari's plight of being a kid that's on the streets trying to figure it out and make it make a way for yourself. He's telling me, you got to get out of this because they're going to put you deeper and deeper into situations. Bakari basically comes in here and asks Lene to hide the guns for him at their house. And I was just so hoping Lene didn't fall for it. And lo and behold, she did. She goes ahead and agrees after he keeps begging her and asking her to put them in the little storage unit in her room in the wall. And she agrees to hide the gun jaw. And I'm just like, this is not going to go well. And I really hate that he's digging her deeper and deeper into the hole that she asked him not to put him in. And of course, before this, he promised her he wouldn't do anything to jeopardize her and get her in trouble. He was crying when they had to get them both out of jail. You know, after the situation happened, you go back and put her into more danger. Sir, how dare you? So now it's Pastor Jackson's funeral. Everybody is dressed in white. They look very beautiful. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm noticing that more and more in television, but I'm so used to that growing up in my church that I grew up in. You know, everybody wears white at funerals. It's considered to be like a homegoing service. So you're not really encouraged to wear black because you're supposed to be celebrating the life of that person. And they feel like black is more of a grieving, dark moment. So this was beautiful to see everybody in white because that's what I'm used to. Um... And, you know, we are zoning initially on Keisha coming in in her white and Emmett is actually standing in one of the pews and they actually start arguing in the back of the church because Emmett is pissed that Keisha went to Nuck about the situation. And Keisha's like, look, we're at his funeral. We're not about to start doing this. And they have, start to have an argument about the fact that, you know, you're supposed to come to me. I'm your man. I'm your protector. But she's like, you're not acting like it. And no, Nuck was able to take care of the situation. I'm trying to protect us. And she's trying to also remind Emmett that, She's sort of strategically using Nuck, like trust her judgment on that situation. And he's like, look, we need to have more conversation about this, but obviously the film was going on. So, you know, it is what it is. We sort of see Papa and his friends sitting together, everybody slowly walking in. I was actually shocked not to see Tiff and Rob here because um, I thought the whole community would come out for it. So I was shocked that they weren't in this scene because a lot of people obviously went to the church at some point or have had instances at that church. So almost, you know, everybody walked in and was there. Why did Duda have the nerve to bring his ass down that uh, vestibule? Like he literally walked into that church. It was utter audacity for him to be strolling in there. Everybody is seated. He walks to the casket and Papa's mom, who was dressed beautifully, you know, in her full first lady realness, honey, with the hat, with the veil, the hat was everything. Um, she stood up with him and was like, what the hell are you doing here? Duda walks up on her and says that, um, you know, he is paying his respects. He respected Pastor Jackson, you know, despite whatever they had gone through in the past. And he said, despite what you've heard about me, um, I was not responsible for your husband's death. And she says to him, like, I know about you and I know that you may not have been the person to pull the trigger, but you definitely were behind the situation. He says he didn't kill him. Um... And she said, you may have not killed him, but I know you had one of your pawns to do it. You need to go. And Duda strolls his old lame ass on out the door. 
So the funeral service proceeds and Papa is giving the eulogy. And that is such a huge undertaking for any young person. So uh, shout out to Papa for being able to do this because I don't even know if I could have at 17 years old be given the eulogy at a parent's funeral. And obviously one he's extremely close to, he obviously know how close him and his father were, how much of an influence his father was on him. And Papa stands up to begin to give the eulogy and he starts to break down because he just realizes how much he's going to miss his father. And he talks about the memories and the lessons his father has given him. And it's hard emotionally for him. And I know in the um, previous scene, just a minute ago, I had like a, a you, you saw Kevin and Jake like standing next to him because they walk up when Papa's breaking down and they kind of come behind him. And it was beautiful to see these young black men just like embrace each other and be there for him. And they stand up with him um, when he is giving the initial part of the eulogy and they just like, you know, have their hands on his shoulder as he's going through. While we're seeing that, we see an interchanging of a bunch of different scenes of showing like what's happening throughout the day for the funeral. So we see like the people lighting candles and going up and walking past his casket. We see friends talking and having conversations. We kind of get a little bit of the repast and we get a bit of the service actually at the graveyard. And all of those scenes are being interchanged between that and Papa's eulogy as he talks about his father. He delivers a really beautiful eulogy. They even show the vigil part that the community had in front of uh, Pastor Jackson's house for him that Victor had talked about with his campaign manager earlier with signs about stopping the violence. And of course, um, you know, Pastor Jackson and what he meant to the community. And we end the episode with Papa finishing off his father's eulogy. And it's a really beautifully shot scene. Everybody in all white, you get to see all the friendships and the people around Pastor Jackson that loved him and that loved Papa and the extension of what he meant as a person in the community for everyone, because this is a local church. So everyone was, a lot of people went to this church. A lot of things happened in this church. And we see the branches of, you know, what this church means to the community throughout that this episode. I really enjoyed this episode. I hope you enjoyed this review. Uh, it looks like we're getting a not last episode, which is weird because we're getting what episode eight coming up and then we're getting a mid season break. So it's, they said mid season finale. So I'm assuming we're going to get the shy coming back in a couple of weeks or possibly in 2024, since this writer's strike is happening. I don't know. I guess more information to come, but next week will be the last episode for the mid season. And then we have a break and then who knows when this other uh, seasons are coming back. I do believe that they have finished shooting all of the shy before the writer's strike happens. So I'm thinking Showtime is trying to save this for next year because we don't know what it's going to look like. And so many shows going into production um, are not are not shooting now. So it's going to, you know, the networks are struggling to find content. And so I think they just want to try to get some of their best stuff, you know, taper it off for a while. Let me know what y'all thought about the episode. Please like. That's the way that we get more people joining our question crew. And I'll see y'all in the next one.